please take your Bible this evening, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 for our scripture reading tonight. We are going to read verses 19 through 25. Hebrews 10 and verses 19 through 25. We'll read these verses responsibly, as we normally do, begin together on 19, then I'll read 20, we'll alternate until we end together on verse number 25 of Hebrews chapter 10. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word, and we'll begin together on verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 10. Ready? Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. And let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon the scripture reading tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful evening we've enjoyed so far. Thank you so much again for the children and the great job they did uh, during their play. And, Lord, we're thankful for the good music we've heard this evening. Uh, it's wonderful to sing the songs of Christmas and the hymns that we have that bring honor and glory to you. And, Lord, we're asking you now that you would help us to stay focused and to uh, clear our mind, Lord, from things that would distract us. And help us to give you our undivided attention as we prepare to look into your word. I pray that you'll bless the special. And that, Lord, as it's sung this evening, we would ask you to tune our hearts to your heart. That we would hear what you would want to say to each of us this evening. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Yeah. 
Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer, and Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the Bible this evening, and I pray, Lord, you'd help us to uh, focus and give our attention now to your word tonight. Spirit of God, speak to our hearts as only you can do, and Lord, I pray that you help us to grasp the truth you have for us tonight from this passage here in Hebrews chapter 10. Help me as I bring the message, and help each individual as they listen, please. May your will be done in each of our lives, in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to open your Bibles to Hebrews 10. I, my daughter-in-law said my grandson was just about finished with everything. In other words, he's tired, he wants to go home. And so she promised him that we're going to sing one more song, then Papa's going to preach, and he's not preaching long. So I guess I'll have to hurry to make sure I obey my daughter-in-law and uh, won't be long with you tonight, all right? But I do want to share this truth with you from Hebrews chapter 10. And Hebrews is all about Jesus Christ being better. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses, better than the law, uh, better than the animal sacrifices, better than the old covenant. Jesus Christ is better. And he's the Son of God. Now in chapter 10, he's emphasizing to us Jesus Christ, one-time sacrifice for sin. One-time sacrifice on the cross for our sins. Notice verse number 9. <clears throat> then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, What's the last three words, church? Once for all. And every priest standing daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never do what, church? Take away sins. But this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Once for all. One sacrifice giving us one salvation that is forever. That's what you and I can have tonight by faith in Jesus Christ. Now while salvation begins with a decision, it doesn't end with a decision. Sometimes making a decision to be saved, you think, well, that... That takes care of that. No, that begins that. Uh, salvation is not just something we did, but it's a way that we live. It's kind of like, kind of like getting married. When you said, I do, that didn't end it. That began it. Okay? And uh, that, that didn't uh, finish it up. That just started it off. It all began there. And there's, several, there's a couple key words when you get into Hebrews chapter 10 that I'm going to draw our attention to tonight, and we're going to look at it. And it starts uh, in verse number 22. And they are imperative. And the key words are, let us. Not let us, like you have on your salad, but let us, okay? And uh, those two words, and they're imperative. You say, what's an imperative? An imperative is a command. It is commanding. It's, it's, uh, it's not advisory. It's not discretionary. This is not something the Lord is suggesting to us. 
This is something He's commanding to us. In fact, it comes from a, uh, the, the word, the imperative there is from impero, which is imperial. We, we get our word emperor uh, from that. In other words, it's a command of a king. Okay? And so He's commanding us some things here that are, that are not voluntary, they're not suggestion. He's your king. These are His commands. Let's look at them this evening. All right, number one, notice verse 22. Let us draw near. Let us draw near. Isn't it great that God would have us draw near to Him? That's the first imperative. Hey, it's not discretionary for you and I to be close to God. God commands us to draw near to Him. Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. God desires to be close to us. Not every, not every person who you may look up to or admire would want to be close to you. Nor would they desire to be close to you. Uh, if you, you, you may uh, admire the president and not admire the president. I remember as I was writing this, I recall when I believe President Obama was campaigning and I think he was at some restaurant somewhere and somebody just walked up in the restaurant and grabbed him and gave him a big hug and lifted him off the ground. Uh, and man, the Secret Service were on him like, you know, <laughs> they were on him real quick. Why? Uh, hey, you can be friendly and you can say hi, but you don't get that close to the president. And uh, don't let that happen. And, and if you just ran up to the current president and tried to do something, you'd probably be in trouble. And uh, you'll be lucky if you don't get shot. And um, they were saying that they, um, uh, the Secret Service is just kind of uh, waiting for someone to maybe, uh, uh, in a situation to arise to where they would have to protect the president because they just can't wait to look at the president and say, Donald Duck. <laughs> but anyway... I just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> uh, you don't get near, you, but God wants us to draw near to Him. Now notice what it says, but wait, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. First thing you need to draw near to God is a true heart. A true heart. That's a sincere heart. That's an honest heart. And again, it's, uh, salvation starts with our heart. With the heart, man believes in the righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It's not like the people who Jesus looked at and said, these people draw nigh to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And, and their heart is not, not that organ beating in your chest. It's your being, your whole being, your entire being. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. It's with all your mind, all your strength, everything you have from the core of your being. Sometimes we do something and we watch somebody do something and we say, well, they did it but their heart wasn't in it. it. means they really didn't have their desire there and their love, their passion wasn't there for it, okay? And there's times we've done things and our heart wasn't in it. Well, here he's saying, if you want to draw near to me, you must have a sincere heart. You'll, you'll, you'll seek me and you'll find me, God told the Israelites, when you seek for me with all your heart. All your heart. And have a sincere heart. Those that worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Serve the Lord in sincerity and in truth. And so you want a sincere heart and you want a truthful heart. A true heart is firmly established on the truth of the Gospel. It's I believed in Christ from my heart and with all my heart. And I have convictions that, listen, that line up or in harmony with the teachings of the Bible and, and they're in harmony with my whole being. I'm not giving it lip service. I'm giving it my life service. I'm showing I obey it with my life. And, and it's a wonderful thing, isn't it, that Lord commands us to draw near to Him. So let us draw near with a true heart. But then secondly, notice what he says, with full assurance of faith. With a full assurance of faith. What is full assurance of faith? That is a couple of verses I want you to look at with me. Will you look just back, first of all, Hebrews chapter 6. Just keep your finger there in 10. We're going to come right back to it. But turn with me to Hebrews 6 and notice with me verse 11. And then if you want to grab Colossians 2, we'll pick up Colossians 2 quickly right after this, okay? Hebrews 6 and verse 11. Where the Bible says this, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the, what church? Full assurance of hope unto the end. There's a full assurance of hope. The other wording was a full assurance of faith. Colossians 2, verse 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, 
and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Whether it's full assurance of understanding, full assurance of hope, full assurance of faith, it is understanding as having the full assurance of what Jesus Christ has done for me. That He shed His blood on the cross, that He paid the penalty for sin, that because His blood was shed, I can be forgiven, and I have been forgiven by God, been justified in His sight, and, and I have, by placing my faith in what Christ has done on the cross, I have forgiveness of sin, I have received the gift of eternal life, and I have assurance that I'll have heaven as my home one day. That's full assurance. I don't just have assurance, I have full assurance. I have absolute, complete assurance of faith in what Christ has done. So he says you have to have, in Hebrews 10, if you're going to draw near, you have to have a um, true heart. You have to have full assurance of faith. And then it says you have your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. Just, just back a chapter or so from this. Right, right chapter before chapter 10. Look at verse 19. Heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. Notice what it says. When Moses, verse 19, had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission, is no remission, no remission of sin is, is understood there. And so notice what he goes on to say. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered. Christ would have often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. It's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Did you notice the sprinkling of the blood on all the things of the Old Testament, all the, the things of the ta tabernacle and the temple of the Old Testament. And what he's saying here is our hearts are sprinkled with the blood of Christ and that takes away the evil conscience. It takes away... Uh, it, you can draw near to God and have a clear conscience doing it. One of the things that keeps people from feeling like I want to get close to God is because I, the things I've done. My past. It condemns me. Why would God want to be close to me? Most people feel unworthy to even have an audience with God. And God says, draw near, and we're, we're concerned because of our past and our guilty conscience. And God says, no, the blood of Jesus Christ, my Son, cleanses you from all sin. And it cleanses and purifies your evil conscience. Then notice, back in chapter 10 again, the... the let us draw near with a true heart, full assurance, our hearts sprinkled with evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. That, I think that's just a reference to the baptismal waters. Our bodies are washed. That's the outward. Our hearts are sprinkled from an evil conscience. That's the inward. The outward is just the... We, we have an outward sign. When we're baptized, what are we saying? But all we're saying is, that's what's taking place on the inside. As I believe Jesus died, He was buried, and He rose again for my sins. There is no salvation in the water. The Bible makes that very clear. You read 1 Peter chapter 3 and it talks about how it's not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. And so it's just showing outwardly that we've been washed inwardly by the blood of Christ. Notice verse number 23 now, the second imperative. The first imperative is let us draw near. The first imperative is what? Let us draw near. The first imperative is what? 
Okay, good. The, the, the better you get these, the sooner you go home. All right? Now, verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Let, hold fast, it means to be glued to. So you made the profession of faith in Christ, you begun believing, continue to believe that. Be what you profess to be. Live out your faith. And remember, you're, you're drawing near to God. And as you draw near to Him, then the command is you hold fast. Stay with your profession of faith. The way people drift away from their profession of faith is they drift away from God. If they don't draw near to God, you won't keep your profession of faith. You won't live the way you know the Bible says you ought to live. And you won't have the ability or the power to live that way. See, when, you, when, when I draw nigh to God, He strengthens me and He helps me. In His presence is fullness of joy. And I begin to understand that when I live for God, it's Him that works in me both to will and to do of His good pleasure. That the, the, power, the, 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 the power in the vessel is not of me, it's of God. And He's the one who strengthens me, not myself. And I get that from being in His presence. Notice the, 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 the way to hold fast and know that we'll hold fast without wavering, without doubting, is there's a parenthesis. What's a parenthesis in the Bible? It's a personal note from the author to the reader. God gave us a personal note here. And you know what He said? He is faithful that promised. If you doubt and waver in your profession of faith, that doubting and that wavering is not from God. That comes from you. Or it comes from Satan. It doesn't come from God. He is faithful that promised. It doesn't matter what you face. It doesn't matter what you go through. He is faithful. Will you face temptation? Yes, you will. But no matter what the temptation is, God is faithful and will not suffer you to be tempted above the area, but will always provide a way to escape. So God is faithful. You may be tempted to leave the doctrines of the faith, or you may become weary and well-doing, but God is faithful. And because God is faithful to me, and God is faithful to you, you can be faithful to Him. We can each be faithful to Him, because He is faithful to us. So, we have the first imperative, let us draw near. The second imperative is, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. The third is in verse 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. All the redeemed, those of us, in, when, when you're redeemed, you become together in a local church which God calls, which Jesus calls His body. We become dependent one on the other. And each one looks out for the welfare of the other. We're just like your body. When, when you're working around the house, if you're nailing something in the wall and you put your up there and it's a small little nail and you're trying to tap it and you hit the wrong nail, bam, you hit that one right there. You know what you do? You do usually do, people do one of two things. They either go, or they go, ah. you know what it is? It's the rest of your body coming to the rescue. The rest of your body coming to aid that one. Okay? It's, it's, that's the way the body works. The body, you don't hit your thumb or something or, or hurt something. If suddenly you get a back pain, you know what you do? Oh. You reach for it. You grab for it. Why? The rest of your body wants to help. See? That's how God says believers are supposed to be. We operate as a body. We're dependent one on another. Your body doesn't say, too bad for you, Thumb. Huh? It doesn't say, too, too bad about your back. Huh? No, everything tries to, to help. Sometimes, if you've heard, a, how many of you have found out that you hurt uh, your ankle or something, and so you walk a little funny and you try to compensate for that, and then your other leg starts hurting because you've been, you've been compensating for the wrong thing. And, and then you threw something else out. But that's just your body trying to help each other out. <clears throat> and so we have to, listen, you're not going to draw near to God and hold fast the profession of your faith and be selfish. 
it's an impossibility. You begin to think of others. Let us consider one another. You, you, don't, you, don't, you never get into the presence of God and spend time in His presence and walk away only thinking about yourself. You always will begin to think about others. It, 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 the spirit of selfishness and being close to God cannot coexist. You're selfish. Selfishness is pride and God resists the proud. And He will not draw nigh to Him if you're proud. We're to go into the presence of God, be filled with the Spirit of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, to go out to be a blessing to others. To be a help and, a, and, and to provoke others here, it says. <clears throat> provoke sounds like a negative thing, but it's really a positive thing. It's, it, it's a word that we would use the word stimulate. Stimulate others. <clears throat> uh, motivate would be a good word. Motivate others. And, and, and so you ask yourself tonight, just ask yourself, don't, don't say anything out loud, but yes, so do I stimulate others to two things, love and good works? Does, does the way I live my life, does the way I conduct my life, does that encourage others to live for God? Does that encourage others to love Him and to do good works? Do I stimulate others? Do you, are you one of those people, we've all been around people, we look at them and say, you know what, being around them just, just makes me want to love God. I, I just, you walk away and say, man, I really enjoyed spending time with them. I always am drawn closer to God because I'm around them. Well, are you that kind of person? Would you inspire that in others? Would you stimulate others to love and to good works? You say, well, it's my business how I live. My business what I do. That's not the talk of a Christian who draws near to God. Who wants to be a blessing to others. So we consider one another. Listen, it's an imperative. It's a command. So I don't, I got enough to, I just worry about me. I don't worry about anybody else. I'm not telling you to worry about someone else. I'm telling you to consider somebody else. Sometimes, Modern day Christians read that. Let us criticize one another. Or they read it, let us condemn one another. Instead of let us consider one another to love and to good works. So we have three imperatives so far. The first one was let us draw near. The second one was let us hold fast. Or what? Nobody knows. Okay, let us hold fast to the profession of our faith. The third one was, let us consider one another. Let us do what? Consider one another. Let us draw near to God. Let us hold fast our profession of faith. Let us consider one another. And then the fourth one is verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I would contend with you that when you draw near to God, when you consider one another to stimulate to love and to good works, when you have full assurance of your faith, you will not forsake the assembling of yourselves together with other believers. That's just the natural thing that comes. And it's, it's not about you. Well, I just don't feel like going tonight. Well, I just don't feel like talking to anybody. So I'm not going to go tonight. Not gonna, I'm going to miss it. If I miss, it doesn't matter. It's okay. And we're only thinking about us. Ourselves. But you understand. It's an imperative. It's a command. You're not just here for yourself. You're here for others. Amen. We're considering one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now, missing church and not being faithful, that's not new to our day. They must have had an issue with it or it wouldn't have been addressed here in Hebrews. Now, in their case, it might have been because of persecution. 
difficulty they would have by going to church. And some people thought rather than, uh, you know, get in trouble or have some problems, I'd just stay away. We don't have that issue. We have the issue of too many other things that get in the way. But when some stay away, it hurts all. When some stay away, it hurts all. We're assembling together to exhort one another. Exhortation is encouragement to each other. There's always, it's always an encouragement to come to church and see someone. It's an encouragement to come to church and see someone else who you, you expected to see here. It's always a discouragement when you come to church and someone's not here you, you expected to see here. And you've all had the same thought. You thought, I wonder if they're okay. I wonder where they are. I wonder if they're sick. I wonder if something happened. I better check on them. You've all had thought the same thing. And so you understand that that, that goes the other way when you're not here. And somebody wonders what's happened to you. Now the Bible says here, notice, that we are to not forsake the assembly of ourselves, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We're not to be assembling less as we see. What day is he talking about? Yeah, the day, the day approaching, the day of the Lord coming back. And so as we see that day getting closer, and listen, I don't know when Jesus is coming back. I know this week the president officially announced that Jerusalem, he wants Jerusalem to be the capital of Israel and recognize it as such and move the embassy there. And I'm for that. I think that's great. And so I don't know, I don't know when Jesus is coming. I don't know if that means He's coming back next week or not. But I know this, we're closer tonight than we ever have been. And I know that if this verse is true, we ought not to be looking for less time to get together. We ought to be looking for more time to get together. Hey, like it or not, look around. Just look around a little bit. You know what? These are the people you're going to spend eternity with. They're going to be in heaven with you. So I don't much care for them. Well, you be careful. God may just put their house right next door to yours. You don't know. So much the more as we see the day approaching. I read an interesting article some time ago that compared a Christian who won't go to church to a student who doesn't go to school. A soldier that doesn't have an army. A citizen who doesn't vote. A sailor that doesn't have a ship. A child that doesn't have a family. A drummer that doesn't have a band, a ball player that doesn't have a team, a honeybee that doesn't have a hive. It's like a Christian that doesn't have a church. Church is for you to be exhorted and encouraged to love and to good works. That's what happens when you come to church. I don't know about you, this is the way to live. This is four imperatives that the Lord gives us. Draw near to God, a true heart, full assurance of faith, heart sprinkled with the blood from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water, holding fast the profession of our faith. He's faithful to me. I'm going to be faithful to Him. To consider one another, to provoke unto love and good works, to stimulate someone else to love others and to do good works for the Lord. And then not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Now I want you to notice something. Look, at, look again, starting at verse 19. By the way, um, verse 18. What's the, what's the punctuation mark at the end of verse 18? A period, okay? New sentence, verse 19. The end of verse 19, what's there? It's a comma. The end of verse 20. Semicolon. 21, 22, there's a period. 23, colon. So we start with 22, there's a period. You go 23, colon, 24, colon. <clears throat> sorry, semicolon 23. And 25, you finally get another period. <clears throat> Most of that whole thing 
is one complete thought. Most that you read all the way through, they build one upon another. Now, hold on. You say, well, that's nice, Pastor, but I don't think I want to live that way. God give me a will, I can do what I want, and you can do what you want. You say, I don't, I don't care to draw near to God. I don't care to obey Him. I know these are commands, but I don't want to obey it. I don't care about drawing near to God. I don't care about other people. I don't care about provoking anybody. I don't, I don't, I don't care about assembling. I don't, I don't give a care about any of that. Well then, the next verses are for you. Let's read together, shall we? Verse 26, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. You've, you've trod, you're trotting underfoot the Son of God and His sacrifice for you. The, Jesus was sacrificed so we could draw nigh to God. It was His sacrifice that broke the veil of the temple and tore it in two. So now it's not a priest that just goes into God. All of us have access to God. And when you don't care about that and you spurn that and you don't, you don't make that uh, uh, an imperative in your life, you're trotting underfoot the Son of God who has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith He was set apart an unholy thing. For verse 30, For we know Him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto Me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again, the Lord shall judge His people. The Lord will judge who? The unsaved? No, His people. People who will not obey His imperatives. God will judge. Verse 31, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You make your choice if you want. There are many people in this room who, who would tell you they made the choice not to obey those commands and it was a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And they repented and they, they, they got right with God and they obeyed the command. My friend, don't reject the truth that you know. You've heard the truth. You're responsible for the truth. Let us draw near. Let us hold fast our profession. Let us consider one another to love and to good works. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You know, a, a former athlete had neglected his body for several years. And so he decided he better begin another exercise routine and get himself into shape. The first day he did several push-ups and went out for a light jog. The next day, more push-ups and then added a few sit-ups and then a little bit longer run. Day three, sit-ups, push-ups, and a half-mile run. On day four, he woke up and he had a sore throat. So he jumped to one more exercise, and that is he jumped to the conclusion that exercising was a bad idea. Because all I got out of my huffing and puffing was I got sick. And he quit. But wait a minute. Let's liken that to a Christian. Maybe realizing you've neglected your relationship with God. You begin a new journey of reading your Bible. Meditating on Scripture. Spending time in prayer talking to God. Trying to develop your relationship with Him. But after you do that for a few days, the same problems arise back up in your life. And what you do is what that ex-athlete did. You decide, well, that doesn't work. I've still got problems. 
I still got issues. So I, I don't think it does any good. But can I tell you something? You don't read the Bible and pray and walk with God and try to have a relationship with Him so you'll have a trouble-free life. It doesn't happen that way. Pursuing God is not a cause and effect. But it does, listen, it draws us closer to the One who is perfect. It draws us closer to the One who David said in His presence is fullness of joy. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to draw my strength. We're all going to have, it rains on the just and the unjust. Nobody's exempt. But how you're going to respond to those trials, how you'll respond to those problems, depends on whether you're drawing from your energy and your strength or whether you're drawing from His. Four imperatives for the believer. Let us draw near. Let us hold fast our profession. Let us consider one another to love and to good works. And let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Let's obey His imperatives. We'll have the life that He desires we have. Let's pray, shall we? Father, I pray You'll take the truth now this evening. Thank You for this wonderful, wonderful passage in Hebrews. Thank You, Lord, that You desire that we be near to You. That's an amazing thing. So many other religions of the world, they just want to keep God at a distance. You're angry or you're mad or you're not approachable. But I'm thanking you tonight, God, that the God of the Bible wants us to be near to Him. Thank you so much for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to once and for all offer the sacrifice for sin so we could draw near to you because of the blood of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, tonight that each of us would, you would search our heart. That each of us would decide tonight that we are going to obey these imperatives. We spoke this morning of you being king of our lives. You're the king of the Jews. And Lord, these are the commands of the king. And I pray that each of us would desire to obey them tonight. And may it help us and may we realize that this is how you desire that we live. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many tonight would say, Pastor, I, I realize that Jesus Christ was God's sacrifice for my sin. I know He paid for my sin debt on the cross when He died. That if I place my faith in Him and what He's done for me in dying for my sins, I can receive the gift of eternal life and one day go to heaven. And Pastor, there was a time in my life when I did that. And my faith and trust is in what Jesus Christ has done for me. It's not in what I do, it's in what He's done. And I've trusted Him as my Savior. Pastor, I know that I have, I have that full assurance of faith tonight because of what Jesus has done. Here's my hand, Pastor, as a testimony. Would you slip it up? Say, I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. If you're here tonight, would say, Pastor, I'm not sure about that. I, don't, I, I couldn't say tonight I have full assurance of faith. The only way you can have that is to know Jesus as your Savior. It's the only way. It's not, it's not based on me. It's based on Him. He is faithful. He said, if you'll call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Not might be or may be or hope to be. You shall be. I wonder if you're here tonight and say, Pastor, I just struggle. I don't have that assurance of faith that if I died, I'd go to heaven. Would you let me pray for you? Not embarrass you, will not call you out, but I'll just remember you in prayer. Would you slip your hand up and put it back down and say, Pastor, pray for me this evening? Is there someone like that tonight? The message was two believers. 
How many believers here tonight would say, Pastor, these four imperatives, I'm going to obey them in my life. If God wants me to draw near, I want to draw near to Him. I'm not going to be content in my life just to be at a distance from God. I want to draw near. I want to... By the way, that's going to mean you'll have full assurance. That's going to mean you'll consider others to stimulate them, to provoke them to love and good works. That means you'll not forsake the assembly of yourself together. It all comes back to wanting to draw near, near to God. How close are you to God tonight? I can tell you, you're as close as you want to be. You're as close as you want to be because God would have you to draw near. If you're tonight would say, Pastor, I want to obey these commands. God has spoken to my heart tonight. Pastor, pray for me. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Say, pray for me tonight, Pastor. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's wonderful. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to Him this evening, will you? Don't resist Him. Do what He's bid you to do in your heart. Heavenly Father, thank You for speaking to our hearts tonight. I pray Your will will be done now in each heart and life. If any here tonight, Lord, has never received You as their Savior, I pray they trust You as their Savior this evening. Lord, I pray those who are here tonight and are saved, and Lord, maybe they need to come and say, I need to be a member at Bible Baptist Church. I'm saved. I'm scripturally baptized. I want to serve the Lord here. Others just need to bow the knee and say, God, I want to draw near. I want to be as close to you as I possibly can be. And all that comes with it because of what Jesus has done for me. Have your way in each heart now, Lord, and may we respond to you. And I'll thank you for it. Quietly with your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. The Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to Him this evening. Will you please? Oh, to Jesus I surrender. All oh, to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender Father, thank you for this evening now. Thank you, Lord, for a wonderful Lord's Day in your house. And, Lord, it's certainly been good to be with the people of God today. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the songs of God that we have to sing. And, Lord, I pray now that you'll dismiss us with your care and make us mindful you go with us from this place tonight. I pray that others will see Christ in our life by the way we live, Lord. We'll always be ready to give an answer of the reason of the hope that lies within us. I pray, Lord, you'll help us to point folks to Christ this Christmas season. And we'll thank you for it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. If um, 
Uh, tomorrow night, if you need a ride to Dear Dutchman, Brother Van Sickle is going to drive the uh, white bus out there. And I'm thinking about quarter of six, Gary. Is that doable for you? Yeah. Quarter of six, he'll leave the church. So if you get here, he'll take you out there, okay? Leave the driving to him, okay? And uh, he'll take care of you. So if you want to do meet here, be ready to go by quarter of six, okay? All right. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's sing it together, shall we? Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go for. It's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.